Supports are one of my favorite parts of Fire Emblem, and a big reason why I look forward to each new game. Small, often slice-of-life style conversations help take our units from balls of stats with a portrait attached to meaningful characters that I want to do my best to protect and help grow. Plus, support partners fight better when they're near each other, and I love it when numbers go up. Support conversations have had a somewhat consistent formula in recent games, but over the course of the series, supports have actually changed quite a bit. I'm going to go over the history of supports throughout the series, and at the end I'll talk a bit more about why I like supports so much, and explain what I would like supports to look like moving forward. The first Fire Emblem game didn't feature any supports, but the second game, Fire Emblem Gaiden, sort of does if you squint, but only for a moment. In the final chapter of Gaiden, if Alma attacks while standing next to Celica, he gets boosted crit. This is similar to the proximity-based stat boosts that units would get from support partners in future games, but it's really easy to miss this in Gaiden, and it's just for one chapter. The first time we see supports across an entire cast of characters is in Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem. In this game, supports are hidden relationships between units that give them a boost to their hit, avoid, and crit rate when they fight within three spaces of each other. As long as the support is two-way, that is. For example, when Marth or Sita fight within three spaces of each other, they have plus 10 accuracy, avoid, and crit. Not all supports are two-way, though. One-way supports also exist, like Katria, who receives a plus 10 bonus when fighting with Minerva, but does not provide any bonus to Minerva. This can either be read to represent Katria's devotion and respect for Minerva, or as Katria benefiting from Minerva's command after years of fighting together as the White Wings. The support bonus also isn't always plus 10. Ryan, for example, only gets a plus 5 bonus for fighting near his brother Gordon. Unlike modern supports, you don't need to do anything to build these supports, units just have them by default. It's pretty easy to miss them on a casual playthrough though, because the game doesn't make it obvious that these supports exist. To be aware of them, you would most likely have to look them up online, or else notice an unexpected boost in accuracy when you incidentally have a unit fight near their support partner. Additionally, FE3 isn't a terribly difficult game, so you can breeze through the game without being aware of supports, and it's no big deal. Supports in this game only really start to shine the faster and more reliably you try to play the game, or in an Iron Man. Marth and Agma both have hit rates in the 90s pretty frequently because swords aren't always 100% accuracy, but both of them have a Sita support. So fighting near Sita pushes those hit rates up to 100, and that might not sound like a huge difference, but over the course of an entire playthrough, ensuring that Marth and Agma don't miss every 15 to 20 attacks or so is nice enough that I often go out of my way to make sure Sita is near them when they attack, but it's not so nice that it's game warping. It's also worth noting that FE3 is a 1RN game, so a 90 displayed hit going to 100 is actually a 10% increase compared to 2RN games where going from 90 displayed hit to 100 displayed hit isn't actually that different. Overall, I would call the implementation of supports in Fire Emblem 3 awkward. It's really easy to not know they exist at all, and I would have liked it if there were more of them. As it stands, there's only about 30 support bonuses in the game, and that's counting two-way supports as two supports. A lot of units don't have any support partners, and I would really like it if a few more of them did. The supports in the game also seem to be largely based on the relationships in Book 2 of the game, which makes some sense, but I would have really liked it if some more units in Book 1 had supports, such as Midia's squad that all joined together in that prison cell. That said, I really like that this system rewards you for having characters with a relationship fight near each other. It adds a little more weight to each relationship when the power of friendship is helping you hit a boss. And I really like the effect it has on gameplay where there's a tangible boost if you place your unit smartly to take advantage of supports. But it's not backbreaking if you don't. Supports also introduce some interesting decision points, like when you have to decide if you want to keep two units together for their support bonus, or split them up so they can accomplish two tasks that are far apart from each other. This is especially common for Sita, who sometimes has to decide if she wants to take advantage of her higher move in flying, or if she wants to lag behind so that she can support Marth and Agma. So I like the way that this system plays. Some other Fire Emblem games use this type of innate support bonus in addition to another support system, and for clarity, when both systems exist, I'll be referring to this type of innate support as a bond support, because that's what they call them in the Tellius games. But after FE3, we have Genealogy of the Holy War, which doesn't have supports per se, but it does have a few related systems and mechanics that I want to talk about that likely influence supports in later games in the series. First, a lot of units in FE4 have little conversations that they can have with each other on certain maps. 
In an early map in Gen 1, for instance, Quan can talk to a young knight he has with him named Finn. The conversation is about Quan telling Finn how much he values him as a soldier of Leinster Kingdom and gives him a brave lance for his troubles at the end of the conversation. FE4's on-map conversations like this one can cover all sorts of topics and provide all sorts of rewards or no reward at all. Sometimes they can even branch depending on what actions you've taken. Like in Chapter 6, where Julia gets a different tome from Selif depending on which castle you seized before you talk to her. In Chapter 3, Ira can receive a Brave Sword from a talk conversation with either Lex or Cullen, but you can only have one of them talk to her per playthrough. The different rewards you can get from talking are something I really like in FE4 and would like to see come back in more modern support systems. Though part of why it works in this game is due to FE4's inventory system, it's cool that Lex gives Ira a Brave Sword because the difficulty of trading means that there's at least a little incentive to keep the Brave Sword on her, and if you do take it off her, she at least gets some extra money to spend. But in modern FE, if someone gave a Myrmidon I wasn't using a Brave Sword, I would have that off of them and onto one of my carries in a heartbeat. Still, this is something I would like to see modern FE experiment with. It would be cool if some supports gave maybe a PRF weapon or a small permanent stat boost instead of a larger passive boost from fighting near an ally. In FE4, on my first playthrough, I was always excited to see what cool things I was going to get from a talk conversation, and I think that's been a little lost in modern FE games. I think these on-map conversations are a big part of why the FE4 cast is so memorable to a lot of people, including myself, because it's by far the most characterization a cast got in their game up to this point in the series. And these conversations even add a tiny little bit of replay value since you can see conversations on a second playthrough that you missed the first time. Of course, talk conversations are not the only way relationships were built and defined in Fire Emblem 4. This was also the first game where we got to play matchmaker and pair our units up romantically. The way that this works in FE4 is that each character has a certain amount of love points with each potential partner. And when they reach 500 love points, they become lovers and will have a kid for you to use in part two of the game. They can gain love points in a few ways. First, each pairing starts with a certain amount of love points. Finn and Bridget, for example, start with 180 love points, while Noish and Ira start with zero. So basically, some units are more compatible with each other than others. But still, 180 is a long way out from 500. Fortunately, units also have a love growth rate, allowing a pairing's love points to grow every turn they exist on the same map, plus a little more if they end their turn next to each other. And like their starting love points, different pairings can have different love growths. Finn has a massive plus 10 per turn love growth with Brigid, and only a plus 2 with Ira, for example. This system of placing your units next to each other to build their relationships is how a lot of future support systems would have supports built. One of the neat things about the way FE4 is set up is that later joining units tend to have at least a couple pairing options with high love bases or growths. This makes it a lot easier to get them to 500 love points in the small number of chapters they have to get it done. There is one other way to gain love points, which is that it can be a reward for a talk conversation. In that conversation I was talking about earlier where Ira gets a brave sword from Lex or Cullen, whichever guy gives her the sword also gets 100 love points with her. There are all sorts of conversations like this that can jumpstart a pairing, and even one that immediately results in a pair becoming lovers. The exact amount of love points a given pairing has is hidden from the player, but in allied castles you can check a pairing's compatibility to get some idea of how far along they are in becoming lovers. The last interesting quirk of the lover system is jealousy, which is a bug that can influence love point gain in certain circumstances, it's a bit beyond the scope of this video to get into the exact way jealousy works, but I've linked to the Serenus Forest page explaining it in the description if you want to check that out. So, FE4 has tons of relationship building systems, and it even iterates on the proximity based stat boost supports gave in FE3. In FE4, units receive a plus 20 crit bonus when adjacent to a sibling or lover. Combined with a high crit weapon, this can get your crit pretty high. I do find that having to be directly adjacent to your sibling or lover to get this bonus is notably more restrictive than supports in FE3, where you just have to be within three spaces of your partner to enjoy the support bonus. In FE3, you could hypothetically have Sita fight an enemy while also being in position to support both Agma and Marth while they fight enemies up to six spaces apart from each other. Having to be directly next to your ally both restricts your movement a bit, 
and also makes the weaker support partner more susceptible to two ranged enemies. So FE4 doesn't quite have supports as we know them today, but you can see the bones of a lot of things that would be rolled into the support system in later games, from buildable relationships with units that end their turn next to each other, to bonuses for units when they fight next to allies that they're close to, to character building conversations that are sometimes tangential to whatever's going on in the main plot. Our next game, Thracia 776, takes a little bit of inspiration from both of its last two predecessors. You don't have to build supports or love points in this game, but on-map conversations return to help characterize your units in the game, though some units have a lot more of these conversations than others. Bond supports from FE3 return in Thracia as well. The main difference between FE5's bond supports and FE3's are that in this game, support bonuses also apply to critical avoid in addition to hit, avoid, and crit. Additionally, there are a lot more supports in this game than there were in 3. On his own, Leaf supports 16 characters, which is over half the total number of supports in FE3. I mostly feel the same way about this system as I do the FE3 one. I really like that there are more of these supports in the game, and I like that Leaf has so many. Leaf supporting so many units helps him to make positive contributions at any point in the game, even if his combat isn't always the most exciting. A lord that partially shines through supports is a nice change of pace. Not too much to say about this one though beyond that, except that some of the one-way supports in this game are pretty funny. Tanya supports her father Dagdar, but he doesn't support her, so I guess she must have forgotten Father's Day one year and Dagdar just never got over it. After Thracia we have Fire Emblem the Binding Blade, and that is where we first see a support system that really resembles modern supports. In this game, each unit has a handful of other units they can support with, but they don't start with any support bonus by default. Instead, you build support points by having two units that can support end their turn next to each other. Once a pair reaches 60 support points, you can view their first support conversation. These are reminiscent of the talk conversations from FE4 and 5 in that they're short conversations between two characters designed to let you learn a bit more about each character in your army. Each pair of units that can support has three conversations with each other that you can view, and after each conversation, the pair's support rank will increase by one, going from nothing to C rank to B rank, and then finally to A rank. Once a pair has a support rank, they get a combat bonus when fighting near each other, and that bonus becomes improved as their support rank increases. Unlike earlier entries in the series, not all support bonuses in FE6 affect the same stats, Instead, each unit has an affinity that determines what support bonuses they provide. For example, a unit with a fire support provides attack, accuracy, avoid, and crit as their support bonus, while a unit with dark affinity provides accuracy, avoid, critical, and crit evade. So if you really want to optimize units, you might consider what support partners will give them the best boost based on their affinities. Similar to the love system in FE4, units have different support bases and growths with different partners. So some supports can be really fast, while others can be really slow. FE6 having multiple support ranks provides some interesting wrinkles compared to FE4 though, mainly that a high base can make for a really quick first support rank, while still making you grind out the rest of the supports. We can see this a bit with Roy, who only needs to stand next to Lelina for a single turn to unlock their C support. Then after that, their plus 4 per turn support growth will make the other ranks come pretty quick, but it won't be instant. On the other hand, Roy has no support base with Lalum, and it only grows by one point per turn, so if you want to unlock an A support between them, it is a glacial crawl to 200 support points. This gets at my biggest complaint with this system, and one that will persist for the rest of the GBA trio of games. Supports, in general, just take way too long to build, especially for units that join later in the game. Many players will only see a few of the fast supports in their first playthrough if they aren't going out of their way to grind supports. Of course, grinding supports isn't hard, you just end turn repeatedly while your units are next to each other, but it would be nice if you didn't have to do that just to see more than a couple support conversations per playthrough. The support conversations that build fast can create some interesting gameplay. Roy can build a C support with Marcus by standing next to him for 15 turns. So in the early game, I enjoy the little minigame of trying to get Roy next to Marcus at the end of each turn so that I can get their support rank up and have Roy provide Marcus with a helpful combat boost. For slower supports though, achieving them without grinding is less likely. 
If you do grind some supports out though, the bonuses are pretty meaningful. Getting extra damage and hit rate is awesome in a game where enemies can be pretty bulky and hit rates can be shaky. But my favorite part of this system isn't any of the mechanical bonuses or how the supports build, it is the support conversations that you get every time a pair of characters gain a support rank. In FE6, these conversations tend to be on the shorter side, but they do a lot to make our units feel more like characters instead of just disposable faces and numbers. A good comparison point here is FE1, because so much of FE6 is inspired by FE1. In FE1, our Axe Bros, Board, and Cord don't really talk much. We still know a little bit about them from the circumstances of their join, but for most players, these units won't be much more than the Axe Bros. But in FE6, through supports, we can learn quite a bit more about our Axe Bros. In Lot's support with Echidna, we learn that Lot is from the Western Isles, that his facial features are common for that area, and we also learn that Lot is something of a pragmatist. He doesn't take his survival in the war for granted, and that while he wants to help Echidna build the village that she wants to build, he worries about logistics like funding while she hasn't given that matter much practical thought. Just from this support chain, we learn quite a bit about Lot, and he still has four other support chains that we could read to learn even more about him. One other major addition to supports in this game is paired endings. When you finish FE6, if you had Roy A support a character, they may have a special paired ending with him. Shanna, for example, marries Roy in her ending if she A supported him. In FE6, these paired endings were limited to Roy, but FE7 and 8 would expand paired endings to other characters as well. FE7, as a result, was basically my introduction to shipping and fandom shipping wars, though I didn't call them that at the time. People used to get really heated about who Rebecca should marry. Go check out old message boards if you don't believe me about that. So FE6's support system has a lot to like, which is probably why they kept it for FE7 and 8. All of FE6's paired endings were romantic, but 7 and 8 expanded on this system and also included platonic paired endings. My favorite of which is Dussel and Amelia in FE8, where Dussel helps Amelia reunite with her family and takes her on as a knightly companion. So 7 and 8 to me had a nicer mix of different relationships in their paired endings. That being said, there are some limitations to this system. First, a unit can only have up to 5 support ranks at a time. So if Lot goes through C, B, and A ranks with Echidna, he could only go through C and B with Lance, and then he wouldn't be able to support anybody else. This prevents you from stacking up a billion support bonuses, but it also prevents you from getting a character's entire story in a single playthrough. Whether this is a pro or a con depends on how much you care to replay Fire Emblem games, though I suspect that most people that are interested in seeing all the supports will do what I did after I finished my first FE6 playthrough, which was look up all the support conversations I was interested in but didn't get in my playthrough online. Another limitation of this format for supports is that because they can be unlocked at any time, they lack any sense of temporality. Units generally won't talk about events unfolding in the story unless they happened before one of the units joined, and you can have characters that have been fighting together for a dozen chapters unlock their first support and behave as if they've only just met. Future games would take some steps to resolve this issue to varying degrees of success. All in all, FE6 made a good first pass at a modern support system, and one that games would iterate upon moving forward. The biggest flaw being that supports are just so tedious to unlock. It's reasonably possible to do an entire blind playthrough of some of the GBA games and not unlock a support if you don't grind for them. I consider it an indictment on the system that most of my engagement with the support system is through reading conversations online rather than experiencing them during gameplay. FE7 and FE8 support systems, as I mentioned, are extremely similar to 6s, but we do see a little bit of change in Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. In Path of Radiance, the biggest change to the support system is how you grow them. Instead of having units end their turn next to each other to build support points, all they have to do is be deployed at the same time. Ike, for example, builds a C support with Oscar after being deployed on the same map as him five times. Like previous games, different units need to spend different amounts of time together to build support ranks, so Oscar may have taken five maps to get to see support with Ike, but Ranulf only takes one. One sneaky benefit of this is that it allows developers to have a bit of a better idea for when you might unlock a support. In our Oscar example, you can't unlock his support in the very early game because Oscar won't have had five maps to share with Ike yet. As a result, the Ike Oscar C support can reference anything that happened in the story prior to the earliest point the support could unlock. 
This is in contrast to the GBA games where it was sometimes possible to get through all of a unit's supports in a few maps if you grinded. Oh, and that's another thing. Grinding was boring in the GBA games and it's just not possible here. All you have to do to build support with a pairing is deploy them on a map together, and that's usually not too big of an ask since you probably mainly care about the supports for units you're using, so they were going to get deployed anyway. So this is a pretty frictionless system, and unlike GBA FE games, you will unlock a lot of supports without even really trying to. In my last FE9 playthrough, I unlocked tons of supports compared to my last FE8 playthrough, where I unlocked exactly one support. I think this was a huge improvement. Support conversations are a big part of how I discovered some of my favorite Fire Emblem characters, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't unlock any of their supports. Outside of how supports are unlocked, they work pretty similarly in this game to the way they did in the GBA games. We have ranks going from C to A, each unit can increase the support rank five times, and you get a bonus for fighting near your support partner depending on what their affinity is, and some units have paired endings with each other. The supports being easier to unlock doesn't just make viewing conversations easier, it also makes supports more of a strategic consideration, because each unit will have more choices for support partners and sooner. So overall, this was a good refinement of the support system in the GBA games. I also want to talk about another system introduced in Path of Radiance that fulfills some of the same goals of the support system, and that's base conversations. In each chapter of Path of Radiance, there are a handful of conversations you can watch in the base before you go to the next map. These conversations can include members of your army or NPCs, and can reward you with useful information for the next map, items, or even new recruits for your army. But importantly, these base conversations provide opportunities for units to get some more dialogue, and dialogue that's topical to recent events in the story. What's cool about base conversations is they even give you opportunities to get to know units that you aren't using. In order to build supports, you need to deploy the relevant units, but if a unit has a base conversation in Chapter 21, they will always have that base conversation, even if they hit the bench a dozen chapters ago. As a result, you get to hear from a lot more of the cast than in previous games, and often more than once. I really like how this system plays with supports. Supports are often a little more tangential to the story and explore specific relationship dynamics, while base conversations ensure that we get a chance to be acquainted with the entire cast, and make sure that if something happens in the story that a cast member should react to, they have an opportunity to do so. A great example of this is after Grail's death, many characters have a base conversation reacting to it. This wouldn't work as well with supports because you couldn't guarantee that the player would be watching the support right after Grail died. So I love both of these systems, I think they pair really nicely together. Radiant Dawn keeps the base conversation system from Path of Radiance, but supports are pretty different. First in the way they build. In FE9, supports built between units just by them being on a map together. And in Radiant Dawn, sharing a map does still build support ranks, but it's not the only way to build them. Certain actions, such as shoving a support partner, or healing them, or ending turn next to them, also build support points. Each support pairing falls into one of five speeds at which their supports can grow, ranging from really slow to really fast. My favorite quirk of this system is that the slowest support partners actually lose support points when they shove each other. This is mostly used for Oliver, because nobody likes Oliver. In theory, the way that supports build in this game is pretty cool. It informs you a bit about the state of the relationship between two characters. Nesala and Jinoff have a pretty rocky relationship, for instance, so they have the slowest possible support building speed. That's cool. The problem is, as far as I can tell, there's no way to tell the speed at which a pairing builds, so it's easy to miss things like Nesala and Jinoff support building slowly. And I suspect for a lot of people, things like that are a fun fact they learn online for second playthroughs. Also new to this game is that units are no longer locked to their support partners for the entire game. They can only have one support partner at a time, but if you decide you want a unit to support with someone else, you can just switch them to the new partner before each chapter. The only cost is that you lose the support you just built up. So you're able to switch what kind of support bonus a unit is getting pretty easily by changing their support partner to one with a different affinity. Of course, for players coming to Radiant Dawn from previous support systems, support building won't feel like the biggest change. The big change is the lack of support conversations. Unlike the last couple games in the series, in Radiant Dawn, increasing in support rank doesn't come with a conversation. 
Instead, support partners can have very short, quippy on-map dialogue with their support partner. This was likely done because of Radiant Dawn's massive cast, as well as units shuffling from army to army, and to compensate, there are a lot of base conversations in Radiant Dawn, so you still have an opportunity to hear from all of your units. Still, I really miss support conversations in this game, and some new Radiant Dawn characters suffer from them going away. It's not the end of the world that the Grail mercenaries don't have new support conversations because we already had a whole game to get to know them. But for new characters like Fiona, there's a lot of screen time that makes it easy for them to be overshadowed by existing fan favorites, and supports could have given us a better chance to get to know those characters. There is one other type of support in Radiant Dawn, and that's bond supports. Unlike the supports I was just talking about, bond supports here are much like the supports in Fire Emblem 3. Some units with close bonds just start with these supports and they can't be removed. When a unit fights near a bond support partner, they get increased crit and crit avoid. This is used for units like Micaiah and Soth or Meg and Brom who have a clear relationship as part of the plot of the game. My favorite part of this system is how it interacts with transfers from FE9. If you got an A support between two units in Path of Radiance, they have a bond support in Radiant Dawn. I think that's a nice touch and pretty unique since this is the only game with transfers. So overall, I like the mechanical changes to Radiant Dawn support system, but I really miss support conversations. But I do appreciate that Radiant Dawn at least kept paired endings, even if there aren't that many of them. Next up, we have Shadow Dragon, which was a remake of Fire Emblem 1. Despite FE1 not having supports, they were added to this version of the game, but they're hidden and there's no conversations. Like FE9, supports in this game grow when units are deployed to a map together. And like previous games, supports have three ranks and going up in rank increases the bonus that you get for the units fighting near each other. Bonuses are the same for all support pairings, so you don't have to worry about picking the best affinity partner for any given pairing. Unique to this game in the series so far is that units can have as many supports as you can grind. In previous games, units were limited to one support at a time or a maximum of five support ranks, but in Shadow Dragon, there's no limit, so Marth can support any number of his 30 plus possible support partners. Like the older games, supports in this game can be one way, so someone like Castor can get a bonus from fighting alongside Sita, but not the other way around. One other funny quirk of Shadow Dragon's support system is that for some units you can't get to an A support because there aren't enough maps in the game. Tiki needs to join Marth for 35 maps to reach their A support, for example, but there just aren't enough maps in the game once Tiki joins for that to happen. So in practice, some supports just don't go up to A rank in this game. I love the mechanical effects supports have on Shadow Dragon once you're aware of them. Marth feels like a much better supporting unit when you realize how many units he can give a boost to. There's also some reward for using units long term because of this system. For instance, if you stick with both Cain and Abel instead of replacing either of them, you are rewarded with a support bonus between the two of them. Much like Radiant Dawn though, I still miss support conversations in this game. I understand why they aren't here. It is, after all, a remake of a game without supports. But I still would have really enjoyed them. And I know I would enjoy them because the next game, New Mystery of the Emblem, is a remake of FE3 and it brings support conversations back, though in a bit of an odd way. Mechanically, supports in New Mystery work pretty much the same way they did in Shadow Dragon. The only notable mechanical difference is that Chris, our avatar, supports all of the characters except for the few units you get in the game's final chapter. This would go on to be pretty standard for avatars in future FEs, but at the time, a character that supported everyone was a little bit novel. But the real difference between Shadow Dragon and New Mystery is that support and base conversations return in New Mystery. Base conversations are used in much the same way as Radiant Dawn, where they give you some useful information about the next map or some extra story content. Support conversations are a little different than usual, though. For one, not every pairing has a support conversation, such as Kane and Abel who can support each other but don't have a conversation to go with it. For pairings that do have conversations, you can access them through the base in this game. Chris has one with everyone, and many characters have a couple other support partners. I for one welcome the return of support conversations, even though they are of pretty varying quality in New Mystery. My only real beef with this system is that the supports are very Avatar-centric. A lot of units only have supports with Chris, and Chris isn't exactly my favorite character to begin with, but even if they were, I would have liked a little more variety. It would have been cool to see Kane and Abel interact a bit more after I used them in four different video games together. 
Still, I appreciate FE12 bringing support conversations back. I really did miss them. After FE12, we have Awakening, which is the game I used to credit for the return of support conversations before I got around to playing a translated version of New Mystery. This game actually changed quite a bit about how supports work though, mainly to support two new mechanics, pair up and child units. In Awakening, you can build supports with a potential partner by doing just about anything. Fighting while paired up, fighting next to a support partner, healing, dancing, grabbing one of the shiny event tiles, using a seed of trust. So, lots of ways to increase support points. In addition to providing support bonuses, higher support levels also make units dual guard and dual attack for each other more, and units also just give bigger pair-up stats depending on how high their support rank is. So you get a lot out of increasing support rank in Awakening. The other thing that supports are relevant for in Awakening is marriage and child units. Awakening included a fourth rank for most support pairings after A, which was S rank. Units can have as many C, B, or A supports as they want, but only one S rank support. This support represents marriage and unlocks a child unit for you to use, usually by playing a paralogue. From their parents, children inherit class options, stats, and skills. This makes children units some of the most flexible in the game, and you can largely make them into whatever you want given the right parents. A funny quirk of this system is that it's the only game I can think of with a mid-game forced support. Krom needs to get married for plot reasons in Awakening, so if you haven't married him off to someone by the time he needs to get married in the story, he just marries whoever he's closest to that isn't already married. As a result, many people that played female Robin ended up in forced marriages to Krom because they didn't know they needed to marry him off, and it's really easy for Robin and Krom to have a high support level. On the flip side, if you want Krom to marry Olivia, who joins right before Krom has to get married in the plot, you need to either marry everyone else off that Krom has had time to build supports with, or try to build up a lot of support with Olivia quickly before it's time for Krom to get married. The last funny quirk of this system is that it is possible for Krom to have no valid spouse options in the army if they've all already been married off, and if this is the case, Krom will marry a random unnamed villager. Obviously, there were a lot of contributing factors to Awakening being successful, but I actually think this support and marriage system was a pretty important part of it. Whenever I hear people talk about Awakening with a new person, one of the first questions they ask is, oh, who did you marry? And the volume of supports, as well as the fact that they unlocked fast compared to something like a GBA-era Fire Emblem game, means that you got so much more of a chance to get to know this cast than in previous games, which I think strongly contributed to how well-liked Awakening's cast was when the game came out. The Awakening support system is revised in Fates, but the bones are pretty similar, with some changes to account for how the pair-up system works differently in Fates compared to Awakening. Beyond that, the main changes are some adjustments to how much different actions grow supports, as well as an additional way to grow supports by gifting units accessories in my castle. Fates also added a supports to pairings who can't get married, which is important for how Fates supports interact with the reclassing system. In Fates, characters can reclass to a couple different class options that are available to them at the start of the game, but they can also unlock new reclassing options via supports. When you S-support one unit with another, they gain access to their partner's base class as a reclassing option when they use a heart seal. a supports work the same way, but with a friendship steal instead of a heart seal. There are a few quirks here, such as units with special classes like Azura giving her support partners her secondary class instead of Dancer. Similarly, if two support partners share a base class, they get access to the secondary class of their partner instead. So, in addition to supporting for better pair-up bonuses, you're also supporting to get units access to new classes and thus new skills. Each unit can only have one S support and one A plus support, so you need to choose carefully, particularly with units that have a much sought-after class. In Conquest, for example, you might want to make multiple units a ninja, but it'll be pretty difficult for all of them to be building supports with Kaze at once, and only one unit can S-support him. So if you want specific builds for your units, you need to plan out your supports to make sure they're possible, and if you want them quickly, you'll need to be proactively building your supports. Tying reclassing to the support system adds more incentive than ever to get your supports built fast, because the faster you get access to all the classes you need, the faster you can get the skills you want and the builds that you want online. Something cool about this system is that I think it works really well for newer players and becomes even more interesting as you learn the game more. 
Classes are pretty easy to understand at a basic level, so it's easy for a new player to grasp what they get out of a support, in a way that's more tangible than the hidden bonuses in some earlier games from supports. But as you play Fates more and get to understand the skills and nuances of the class system, as well as what chapters you want to hit your reclasses by, the support system becomes even more interesting. Mechanically, I think this is the strongest support system the series has ever had. Support building methods are intuitive in that the things you expect to build supports do build supports, and the rewards are very tangible and feel impactful. It's a system that encourages you to think about what you're doing and rewards you for doing so. Fates also brings back kids, and if you're planning on using them, you will also want to think about your pairings in terms of what they provide for their children. After Fates, we had Fire Emblem Echoes, which is a remake of Gaiden. That game didn't have supports unless you want to count Celica and Alm in the final map of the game, but Echoes added them, just dialed back a little bit compared to its contemporaries. Characters in Echoes usually have between just one and three supports. The obvious downside of this is that characters have a lot less dialogue, but on the other hand, all of the support partners in Echoes make sense and have a certain chemistry that could be lacking in games where units have a dozen plus supports. Still, I would have enjoyed a couple more supports per character. Bond supports that you don't have to build at all also return in this game and are usually limited to characters that have prior relationships, such as Alm and the male Ram Villagers. Supports don't have a standard bonus in this game, with the bonus instead depending on the pairing and support rank. Alm gets a Void and Crit Evade from his support with Claire, for example, while he gets Hit and a Void from his support with Mycin. Supports build in this game when potential partners are deployed on a map together, when potential partners cast white magic on each other, or when potential partners end their turn within two spaces of each other. The lack of pair-up or child units in this game and the bonuses being variable depending on the pairing makes this system feel reminiscent of the GBA games and FE9, which also had more limited support partners and the affinity system that made supports provide different combat bonuses. Not too much to say about Echo's support system that I haven't already said about previous ones. After Echo's though, we have Three Houses, which made some notable changes. First, supports can be built in some new ways. You can get support points in the usual way by having units fight alongside each other, but Three Houses also added a lot of out-of-battle ways to build supports. First, often when you're talking to a character, you will get an opportunity to choose a dialogue option. And some of those dialogue options give support points, some lose them, and some have no effect. I like that this encourages you to engage a bit more with the game's dialogue, but I don't like how it generally rewards you for just agreeing with the person you're talking to a large percentage of the time, rather than thinking about what might be the best thing to say to them beyond what's going to make them happiest to hear in that moment. Beyond these dialogue options, you can also build support rank with units by doing any number of out-of-combat tasks with them, such as eating a meal together, cooking together, performing in choir, returning a lost item to them, or giving them a gift. Some of these apply to Byleth only, like only Byleth can give other units gifts. But a lot of these activities, such as eating a meal, involve Byleth and two other characters, and when you do these activities, the whole trio gains support points with each other. It's pretty quick to build supports in three houses, so long as you're regularly doing these activities with students, you'll unlock some conversations in no time. Alternatively, if you want to unlock someone's support really fast, you can just shower them in flowers and owl feathers until they like you. And you will definitely want to make sure you get those supports cooking as fast as possible because there are many benefits to doing so. As always, we have some combat benefits, though they're a little different than in previous games. In this game, your support partners provide you with bonuses during link attacks and gambit boosts. A link attack is any attack you make against an enemy that an ally could also attack with the weapon they currently have equipped. So if you attack an enemy with Byleth and Claude is standing behind them with a bow, you get a link attack. And what this does is add hit and avoid to the attacker, with the amount added rising as your support level rises. Certain special supports also add attack. This is mostly reserved for particularly close characters like Claude and Hilda. Supports also help us out when it comes to Gambit Boosts. Gambit Boosts activate under similar conditions to Link Attacks, except that the attacker has to be using a Gambit instead of a normal attack. Gambit Boosts add attack and proficiency to your Gambit, and again, the value of the boost increases with support level. Of course, combat bonuses aren't the only reason you want supports in Three Houses, as this is the only game in the series where you can support with units that you haven't recruited yet. 
Obviously, it can be fun to support with the other faculty or students outside of your class just for narrative reasons, but building these supports also makes units easier to recruit. Each student has a stat and skill that they like and will join your class when you have those stats and skills at a certain rank, but the stat and skill requirement for recruiting each unit is reduced as you increase your support rank with them. So if you want to recruit Ferdinand, but you don't want to spend a bunch of time increasing your heavy armor skill, you can instead shower him with flowers to increase his support rank and lower how high your armor level needs to be. Faculty are a little different than students because they just care what level Byleth is, but again, that level requirement can be reduced by building support rank. Catherine normally won't join until Byleth is level 15, but we can reduce that down to 9 or 12 by building support with her. This makes it a lot more manageable to get her early for difficult chapters like chapter 5. One cool aspect of this system is that it really makes you think about how you want to spend your time in the early game. At that point in the game, you don't have a ton of activity points, and you don't have a tremendous amount of gifts to give out either. So you have to decide which units you want to recruit early while putting off others for later. On a first playthrough, many people will fail to recruit everyone, so in that case you have to decide which characters get to make the team, and which will never be recruited. Fortunately, the game gives you all the units that you need to beat the game at the beginning, so there's no need to stress if you don't manage to recruit all of the characters. Like many previous games in the series, Three Houses does include paired endings, though they were implemented a little awkwardly in the base game. Units can achieve a maximum of an A rank support with their partners, but some pairings end at B. Many pairings that go up to A have a paired ending, but if a character has an A rank with multiple partners that could have a paired ending, the game selects which one you get based on which partner has more support points. It's pretty difficult to track which pairings have the most points as a player, so often it was easier to just make sure your unit only achieved an A support with the paired ending candidate that you preferred. That way you would definitely get the one you want. Eventually, Three Houses did add the Wayseer, who lets you force a paired ending that you want, but it would have been nice if this were in the base game. At the end of the game, Byleth has an opportunity to give a ring to many of their support partners, which usually results in a romantic ending. I do want to give a quick shout out to the monastery here as well, as I feel it fills a similar role to base conversations from Tellius. At the monastery between chapters, you can talk to students and get their thoughts on current events, upcoming battles, or just pick up some quests from them to complete. These little conversations allow you to get to know characters outside of your house so that you can decide who you want to recruit, and also allows units to react to events of the story without complicating support writing. A great example of this is Ash reacting to the chapter where you fight Lord Lonato. A scene where he dreads the upcoming battle really only makes sense to happen in that chapter, so it can't be placed in a support that could be unlocked at a different time. The way the monastery allows you to get to know the cast is its strongest aspect. Speaking of timely conversations though, some supports in Three Houses are also time-gated, so you'll raise a character's support and the game will tell you that you need to wait before you can view the conversation. I actually really like this, it allows supports to react better to major events in the game. Leonie can react to Gerald's death in her support with Byleth only because the game doesn't let you unlock all of her supports before that happens. Sometimes it can be frustrating not to be able to raise your support level with a unit, especially if you're trying to recruit them, but I think the time-locked supports make for much more impactful writing. So overall, I'm quite fond of Three Houses' support system, and I like that they added some pretty clear visual indicators for Link Attack and Gambit Boost so that it's very obvious when you're benefiting from fighting alongside your buddies. Lastly, we have Fire Emblem's most recent game, Fire Emblem Engage. Engage keeps a lot of the social sim elements for building supports from Three Houses while dialing back some of the other ones. Cooking and eating meals is one activity now, there's no choir, but the broad strokes are the same. We build supports by giving gifts, doing activities, and having allies fight near each other. No linked attacks or gambit boosts in this one though, instead units just give a bonus to support partners within three spaces of them, and what the support bonuses do depend on the partner. There are six sets of bonuses, and each unit provides one of them. So some increase hit a lot, others increase crit, some increase avoid, you get the idea. The one common trait among them is that all of them increase hit by at least 10. So supports can be a great way to bolster your accuracy, which is nice because then you don't have to spend a skill on that. Extra crit can be great for builds that want to be critting all the time as well, 
If you're doing something like a Vantage Wrath build, it's very important that the user have 100 crit and good hit. A support can help you get those last few points of hit and crit that you need. Hit plus supports are also great for making sure you hit important attacks. If you only have one archer, for example, it's pretty important that they hit their attacks on all the scary flyers, and a support makes that a little more reliable. Interestingly, when Engage came out, a common criticism was that it took too long to build supports. I never really felt this issue personally, but to address it, three quick support building activities were added to the game that you can do each trip to the Somniel. So if you have specific supports that you want to build, you can do so pretty quickly using those. Supports just go up to A in this game, but towards the end of the game, Alir can give a Pact Ring to one of their A support partners, resulting in one more conversation. Sometimes these Pact Ring conversations are romantic, and sometimes they're not. But either way, they functionally give your support partner Bond Rank 21 with Alir as an emblem, and provide you with one additional conversation. Paired endings were dialed back in this game. The only character that can get one is Alir, who has a paired ending with whoever they give the Pact Ring to. I'm glad that Alir has paired endings, but I really miss having them for other characters in this game. Paired endings are a great way of giving the player a little bit of influence on the ending of each character, and also help to make each playthrough feel a little different, so I was pretty sad to see them gone here. Alright, that's all of the support systems in the series, as well as some information about support adjacent features. So let me talk about what my ideal support system would look like and why. I think supports are at their best when they are paired with some supplementary system, whether that be map conversations like in FE4 and 5, or hub conversations like in Tellius and Three Houses. These systems pair very nicely together because supports can provide us with explorations of dynamics between a pair of characters over multiple conversations, and provide the player a fun element of choice because you get to decide who you want to pair together, while hub conversations can provide us with dialogue that is more directly related to current events of the story. They allow us to see how a character is reacting to current events or what they think of the battle to come. This could also be done with on-map conversations, which works very well in the Yggdral games. The combination of these elements worked great in Three Houses and Tellius, and I would like to see it come back. I also really want paired endings back. Mechanically, I like that the series experiments with different systems, but I'm pretty fond of how Shadow Dragons works. I like that supports grow by units spending maps together, so there's no need to tediously end turns a bunch of times in a row to grind supports. I much prefer this to on-map grinding. I also really like that the support bonuses are uniform. All supports give the same amount of accuracy, avoid, crit, and crit evade, and I like that it's easy to grasp and remember since modern FE games tend to include more skills and on-map effects so there's often a lot of complexity to keep track of already. Additionally, I like pairing my units based on what supports I want to read, and it's a little unfortunate in games with affinities or variable support bonuses when a support you want to read doesn't give good bonuses. So basically, I would love Tellius in Three Houses style narrative implementation and Shadow Dragon-esque mechanics. Also, less hidden information. A lot of what I've talked about in the video isn't obviously visible in the games, and sometimes it's not visible at all. Players should be able to easily determine how supports build and what the support bonuses are for their current supports, and some games do this better than others, I would just like it to be consistently very clear. I also think there are some new ways the series could experiment with supports that I would like to see. If games are going to continue having variable support bonuses, I would like to see them get a little more creative with what the rewards from supports could be. Most of them can still be stats, but maybe certain supports could unlock a skill, or provide a unit with a new PRF item or a smaller but permanent stat bonus. When I think about FE4, some of the most memorable talk conversations are the ones that provide you with a new exciting bonus, and these bonuses also tell you something about the relationship between the characters. Earlier I talked a little bit about Quan's map conversations with Finn in FE4. In one, he provides Finn with some training and Finn permanently gains some stats, and in another he gives Finn a Brave Lance, which is then called back to in FE5 when Finn comes with a PRF Brave Lance in his starting inventory. Not only are these rewards exciting, they fit with the dynamic of the relationship. Quan is training Finn, so Quan doesn't get any bonus from the conversation. But Finn gets a very meaningful bonus because he's the one benefiting from Quan's mentorship. I think this dynamic could easily be grafted onto the support system. Take something like Amelia's support with Dussel in Fire Emblem 8. In the beginning of this support, Dussel is advising Amelia on her spear technique, so it's easy to imagine after finishing the support, Amelia could gain some weapon EXP. 
or even a level or two from the support conversation, either instead of or in addition to the usual bonuses. And I think you could go pretty wild with this. If a support involves one unit teaching another how to use a bow, they could gain bow proficiency. If it focuses on one character joining another for fitness training, they could gain a couple points of HP permanently. Not every support has to have something like this, most of them probably shouldn't, but I think sprinkling in some support bonuses like this would spice up the support system a bit more and make some support chains really memorable. I would also be interested in seeing what supports would look like if they were a little more limited in quantity, but had an additional rank. Fire Emblem characters have tons of supports these days, and there's usually some weak ones that feel kind of like filler. I wouldn't mind cutting some of those supports in favor of an additional conversation on the most important support chains. Of course, there's about a billion other ways they could experiment with supports, and I would like to see them do more with the system. Just please bring back paired endings. I miss them. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you liked it and you want to see more videos like it, consider hitting the like and subscribe button so you never miss an upload, or hop in the community discord that you'll find linked in the video description. As always, a big thank you to my geckos on Patreon, and a shout out to my skinks, Aaron Geddon, Cosplay Sylveon, Doopy, Emma, Ike Pumi Cabre, Lonely Voxel, Lucy Sev, Morgwolf, Red Mage Morgan, Stars to Art, The Noodle Doodler, Upscale Furry Trash, Van West, and Wingman. If you want to support the channel and get shoutouts in videos like these, there's a link to the Patreon in the video description. Either way, thank you for hanging out, and have yourself a lovely week.